So, as the title declares, I'm going to speak all about invisible connections in the early modern anatomy, pores, channels, and vessels. And uh, I wanted to start with a quote that, in my opinion, summarizes everything I'm going to say. And it's taken from a marginal by Thomas Lineker on Galen's Naturalibus Facultatibus. Our entire body is perspirable and permeable to fluids by a common interstices. Totum corpus nostrum est conspirabile et confluxile permeatus communes. The safest characterization of pre modern conception of the body is that of a solid structure wherein humors flow in all directions, upwards and downwards, from the center to the periphery. Accordingly, Late medieval anatomical illustrations of the Fünfbilder Serie or five figure series often show, as it is the case in manuscript 49 under Welcome Trust, the heart circularly shaped rather than pyramidal, for its function is reassumed in the capacity to push and pull the blood in all directions of the body. Viscosity and moisture are integral a part of this vision with blood and heat playing the most important role in triggering, promoting, and maintaining bodily processes. It necessarily follows from this that to befit the flow of humors, the body has to be arranged as a solid yet permeable structure, articulated in organs whose shape allows moisture to percolate, humors to be carried around, residua in Latin superfluitates, to be expelled. Thus, the body ought to allow for the existence of various pores, channels, and vessels. Here we have, however concisely drafted, the Hippocratic conception of anatomy, with organs regarded as funnels, the heart as an oil lamp, and the body as a whole, seen as an interlocked series of contained, containing, and mobile parts, contenta, continencia, and impetus faciencia. Although the Hippocratic authors lacked a clear understanding of the internal anatomy of the body, it would be wrong to assume that the Alexandrinians and Galen could move much further than this oversimplified picture. Even in the most advanced mechanistic explanation of physiology, that is the first century physiology for Sistatus or Rophilus, anatomy's most important task is to uncover how internal structures can make sense of an a priori physiology. The process of cutting up the course, ana temno, anatomy, is thus uh, an act of uncovering what is clear to the mind, but obscure to the senses. In essence, a process of clarification by a manipulation, not yet a process of experimentation. I follow in these the thesis of Roger French, which I share. Unsurprisingly, therefore, when this section was rediscovered in 14th century Italy, it followed the same historical trajectory that was proper to it since antiquity. Anatomy and physiology were distinct fields of inquiry, with anatomy mostly, if not solely, meant to complement natural philosophical assumptions with a proper illustration in re. It is noteworthy, in this sense, the opening of Berengario da Carpi Isagoge Breves, 1523, Illumina me, Domine, Spiritus Veritatis, et manifestabo opera manum tuarum, enlighten me, O Lord, with the spirit of truth, and I shall manifest the work of your hands. The emphasis here lies on making manifest, manifestabo, manifestare, the way in which God, that is, an, arch an archetypal mind, operates in nature by replicating it by human means, an operation that is in turn manifested by the illustrations Berengario provided his book with, engraving a man revealing the muscles of the abdomen as if he were raising the curtain of his inner self. By and large, hypothesis amenable to rational account was to suppose a general continuity within the body, and the fluidity of humors certainly served the purpose even when anatomical inspection actually contradicted the physiological hypothesis. A case in point was arteries and cerebral ventricles, which both appear empty at the autopsy, but they were supposed to be filled nevertheless while the animal was alive with a fluid substance called pneuma or spiritus, whose main reservoir was posited in the brain. 
nerves were conceived as hollow, uh, for the, uh, as hollow vessels for the distribution of the pneuma from the brain to all sentient parts of the body and kept being considered hollow as late as the 18th century, when the discovery of animal electricity was believed to consist in a current flowing from the brain through the nervous system with the cerebral ventricles acting as a laden jar. In short, to allow part-to-part -part communication, certain connective structures must be regarded as hollow, even when they are not such an anatomical inspection. It does make sense that when the anatomy of human corpses and vivisection of animals started being carried out in earnest, which basically means after 1540s, they initially followed the directions Galen had prescribed for physiological reasoning. The body is articulated in three main cavities or bellies, venter superior, venter inferior, and venter infimus, corresponding to the head, the abdomen, and the lower articulations, while the true function of an organ is to be discovered by isolating it from the system of channels and vessels that serve to connect it to the other parts of the body, so as to observe what function is impaired as a result. Standard among such procedures, uh, sorry, standard among st such procedures was the ligament of nerves and blood vessels, as well as various other connections that physicians postulated to make sense of the informal observation. With this proviso in mind, in this paper, I'm going to show some case studies which I will try to contextualize them briefly. To begin with, uh, it is important to highlight that informal observations, that is, personal experiences or reports of witness but apparently inexplicable phenomena, were mostly regarded in the Renaissance as instances of sympathy and antipathy, sympathia et antipathia rerum, that is, similarities, affinities, correspondences, but also, also most importantly, reactions and counter reactions between phenomena as occurring at a distance. Much of the debate about sympathies and antipathies is pertinent to anatomy in that it represented a projection into the cosmos of the organic unity of the body. Seen as an organism not admitting of empty spaces, the cosmos was indeed rife with invisible pathways through which parts acted and reacted in turn as in the body. By the same token, it is important to remind ourselves that much like anatomy, humoral pathology provided a systemic explanation as to how the body worked. In effect, individual diseases in the modern sense of the word were neither conceptualized nor could exist. What is manifested in the affected part, locus affectus, is just the lo local instantiation of a general disequilibrium in the fluid components of the body as a whole. This strict dependence of the particular on the general, both anatomical and physiological, is a result of the fact that all parts of the organism are continuous to each other by reason of their hollow spaces being filled by organic matter, if of different quality and function. As an example, the interstices in the flesh of muscles are occupied by cartilage, fat, nerves, or panicles, or even, if very thin, subtiliora, by fluid components such as spirits and humors, everything is filled. Synonymous with sympathy were therefore terms such as communio and communicatio in anatomy, which were invoked to explain phenomena occurring in parallel or as a result one of the another, as for instance, childbirth and breastfeeding in women or stupidity and castration in man. In the early 16th century, the Italian anatomist Bassanio Landi taught his students that the vena cava could act as a channel through which the uterus and the breast could communicate. Start of quote, which I hope cannot cause outrage. The usage of the breast is proper to females so as to nourish the fetus. To this breast, in fact, comes a vein that departs from the vena cava around the height of the collarbone. This vein conjoins with the vein that from the uterus goes up along the rectus abdominis muscle, as we have said. This is the reason why there exists the greatest affinity, maxime est communio, between the breasts and the uterus. So much so, if we want to check whether women at their periods, we attach suction cups to these very breasts. Furthermore, from this, from this we gather a great and portentous secret 
Indeed, if you want to know whether at a given period a female is well disposed to and ready for coitus, touch the breasts, and if they become turgid, the raise up. This is a sign that she desires coitus. Similar effects, if on different organs, were, were witnessed in man, at least according to Huarte, which lists them as cases of correspondent, correspondencia. But the member which most partakes the alteration of a belly, all physicians say, is the brain. Though they have not set down the reason whereon they ground this correspondent, correspondencia. True it is Galen proved by experience that by spaying a soul, she becomes fair and fat, and her flesh very savory. And if she has a cold, she tastes little better than dog's flesh. Whereby we can see that the belly and the cold carry great efficacy to communicate and communicar the temperature of all the other parts to the body, especially to the brain, for that the same is cold and most like themselves. As with all cases of continuity, correspondences between different organs can be revealed most effectively when they are interrupted by solutio continuitatis, as is the case with wounds, diseases, or when an anatomist intentionally severs their link. To this latter group, that is continuity and discontinuity, belong one spectacular experiment that Galen had proposed in his An in arteris sanguis continuator, whether the arteries contain blood, and which became a point of contention in the Renaissance. In this later treatise, Galen set to investigate the cause of the pulse, be this dependent on the pressure exerted by the blood, of, uh, the blood wave on, on the walls of the arteries or on the arteries full satire faculty. He cuts longitudinally a big artery, most probably the femoral one, and then inserts a thin reed in it. If the movements of the pulse is conveyed by blood, then it should continue after the reed has been inserted. The opposite would prove that the movement depends upon the artery's full satire faculty. This is a complex and indeed very advanced experiment that set the ground for a great controversy between Renaissance physicians and most famously between René Descartes and William Harvey with regard to the interpretation to be given to the circulation of the blood. The central issue in this experiment is to prove not to discover how a certain fluid is conveyed through channels, whereas the passage of the blood is manifest, that of the pulsatile faculty is invisible. Another series of observations can be grouped under the broad category of free flow and blockage. The most, famous, sorry, the most famous example of this being the functioning of the heart and the direction of the blood flow. The ancients knew that arterial and venous blood differ in kind. They even suspected that a passage between the two should occur, despite the fact that almost all anatomists up to Harvey believed that the veins grew out of the liver. This passage was supposed to occur by means of pores in the intraventricular septum of the heart. Conveniently, these pores were too small to be seen at a naked eye, but large enough to allow blood to percolate from the left to the right ventricle. As soon as anatomists like Berengario da Carpi and Vesalius started dissecting, sorry, started dissecting the art in illness, they voiced their skepticism about the possibility the communication between the two systems, arterial and venal, could actually take place in the art. At stake was not only Galenic physiology, but a series of surgical practices depending upon it, first and foremost, bloodletting. A controversy therefore broke out as the direction followed by the blood flow in the veins and how to relieve the inflation of blood around the pleura in pleurisy. An example of this being the lectures on bloodletting by Pierre Brissot, 1478-1522, and Andreas Vesalius, 1514-1564. Although 16th century physicians have theorized the possibility for the blood to move in circle, which is Alpino, and that rediscovered the lesser circulation with Colombo, things started getting even more complicated when Girolamo Fabrici da Acqua Pendente, 1533-1619, demonstrated in Padua the existence of the valves in the veins at around 1580s. Galen's system of physiology had no need for such valves, given that it admitted the percolation of blood in the intraventricular septum. And the Papandente was left speculating about their utility in the body. 
He relied on galenic physiology nevertheless and proved the existence of these valves by binding the right arm as if he was to prepare it for bloodletting, therefore closing, sorry, therefore causing a blockage in the free flow of the blood. This resulted in the appearance of little knots below the bandage point. Again, by drawing on the elegant contraposition between free flow and blockage, Acropendente compared these valves to little sluices or steola using on the Veneto rivers by mill farmers to direct the flow of water to put in motion mill wheels. To the same conceptual category, free flow and blockage, belongs the second group of experiences concerned with the discharge of feces, either in form of a perspiration or also solid and liquid excrement. The latter type was of rather manifest kind, but the former required more subtle investigation. A real excrement resulted from a physiological theory that likened the art to a kiln with a fire contained in its left ventricle. As a consequence, the art's fire had to be kept alive by a constant ventilation of new air, a process called eventatio, and the expulsion of its exhausted vapors, fuliginous, via the respiration cycle, which in turn was compared to the motion of mechanical bellows. In the expulsion of exhausted vapors by expiration was not enough for the body to work at its best, for not all the vapors could be evacuated by a breath, and a part of this was converted into mucus and catar when it came into contact with the cold surface of the brain. Here again, a secret passage for the evacuation of such secretion was supposed to exist. Mucus and catar were supposed, up to Schneider, the Ossecri before me, to percolate directly from the brain to the nose via foramina in the ethmoid bone, os cribriformis. Other vapors instead could be expelled invisibly via insensible perspiration, which was the object of Santorio Santori, famous work as the Statica Medicina. This work, a milestone in experimental physiology, established in mathematical terms <clears throat> the rapport between the general equilibrium of the body and the discharge of a constant quantity of matter undetected by the senses, but detectable through instruments such as precision scales, the most famous of which was the Sella Santorio, Santorio's chair. Santorio frames his studies on insensible perspiration as the discharge of a superfluous matter, superfluitas, through invisible pores, permeatus insensibilis, permeatus invisibilis, whose existence is suspects in the skin, yet cannot prove, neither see. To be able to pass through these invisible pores, matter must be thin, materia est subtilis, a hypothesis that was to play an important role in the natural philosophy of Sébastien Basson and René Descartes, concerned with explaining away the possibility of action at a distance. Indeed, the discharge of this subtle matter occurs in form of effluvia, namely, again, as channels formed in the medium by the air, sorry, in the medium of the air, by the impetus of the particles contained within them. A final group of experiences I will illustrate deals with injections. To be sure, injections are of external substances directly into the blood mainstream, did not gain currency until the mid of the 17th century with the work Prismatica Nova, 1665, by Jon Sigismund Eschholz, 1632-1688. Pre existed. In his anatomical studies, Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 1519, had injected liquid wax um, into the brain cavities of an ox so as to grasp their true shape and volume, which is undetectable after the animal's death because of the collapse of the ventricles' walls. An experiment which illustrates in the manuscript Clark, folio 19,127 recto. The study of the shape of brain's ventricles was part of Leonardo's interest in the nervous system, of course, and most notably in locating the rational zone in a specific part of the brain. So this experiment was also intended to make visible the channels through which pneuma circulated in the brain. Other kinds of injections were meant to ascertain the extent to which a channel or a vessel actually connected two or more distant parts. A case in point was that of the pylorus. André Dulaurent, 
1558-1609, and again, we already mentioned Santorio Santori, showed experimentally that by injecting water with uh, a siphon into, a lar into the large intestine and pushing it onwards, uh, water could not be forced to pass because communication was interrupted and the pylorus closed the passage hermetically. On the contrary, a free flow could be witnessed by injecting water from the small intestine downwards as made possible by the restructure of the pylorus. Santorio in particular concluded that the usage of enemas to relieve constipation was useless, given the discontinuation of the passage between the large and small intestine. What these examples I've discussed thus far have in common is the underlying idea that the only form of action admissible within a plenum is contact. And they were in many cases used to explain a way, the magical, occult, and uh, invisible effects supposed by the actions at a distance. That is, the reaction between two or more distant phenomena is occurring apart from the existence of a material medium. As I already said before, anatomy is a way to make clear in this case, okay? To explain away what would be otherwise invisible or occult. The popularity of the action at a distance as a medical explanation gained momentum in the latter quarter of the 16th century and reached its peak with Jean-Baptiste Van Helmont, 1580-1644, who theorized the magnetic cure of diseases according to which the physician was required to cure the weapon that caused the wound rather than the wound itself. Be this as it may, learned medicine remained on the whole little concern with such explanations. To be sure, with the emergence of mechanical philosophy and quantified medicine, the body started being represented differently and its association with the kiln, that is with the cooking process, gave way to the adoption of the clockwork analogy. Yet since the model explains the connection between parts only by a long series of intermediate passages, it could satisfy physiological explanations only in part. Thus, to get a sense of how important invisible channels, vessels, and pores remain throughout the early modern period, and this is to say, basically, the idea that the body is a pneumatic hydraulic machine with channels that communicate from part to part, some adjust to peruse the appearance of Linnaeus Clavis Medicinalis, sorry, Clavis Medicine Duplex, 1766, wherein Linnaeus unequivocally states, corporis machina pneumatico hydraulica moderato la vita. The pneumatic hydraulic machine of the body is regulated by life. As it appears, while clearly the fluids contained within the body are no longer humors, but acids and electric currents, Channels convey fluid substances, gases, currents, acids, that allow for the reaction of distant parts pursuant to the Hippocratic and Galenic conception of the body. In the light of this, and as a way of conclusion, we may ask ourselves how radical were the breaks operated by the great medical revolutions of the 17th century, when in fact the majority of them was rooted in such a classical framework. But this is a different story and maybe an argument for a different time. Thank you very much.